This is Dyslexia, a Lifelong Journey. I'm Renee Bodley Miller, General Manager of KPCW. It's my honor to be your host for this evening's program. We're so glad you're here. Our first speaker is Professor Bill Therian from UVA's Curry School of Education and Human Development. Bill received his bachelor's degree in communications from the Pennsylvania State University, master's degree in special education from Arizona State University, and a PhD in special education from Pennsylvania State University. Prior to his appointment at UVA, Therian was a special education teacher in Arizona, Alaska, and Pennsylvania, and a faculty member at Miami University and the University of Iowa. Currently, Therian is a special education professor and coordinator of the research and practice group for STAR, and that stands for Supporting Transformative Autism Research Project. He's also the co-editor of Exceptional Children, the flagship research journal of the Council for Exceptional Children, otherwise known as CEC. Therian has extensive experience designing and evaluating academic programming for students with autism, particularly in the areas of science, reading, and written expression. His numerous publications deal with academic programming for at-risk students and students with autism and learning disabilities. In his work, Therian employs a variety of methods, including single subject, experimental, and quasi-experimental group research designs. Therian has conducted numerous meta-analyses in the areas of reading, science, and special education. He successfully directed and co-directed over 15 federal and state grants totaling more than $14 million in funding. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Therian. Thank you so much for having me here uh, and welcoming to Utah. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so what I want to talk about today is uh, dyslexia, a case for a comprehensive strength-based approach. So I'm gonna, I want you to think about the challenges that we have and where the future might be. But before we get there, since uh, we're from all the way on the East Coast, I wanted to talk a little, I wanted to brag a little bit about UVA and uh, UVA special education program. So um, uh, our special education program and our reading program are are pretty well known. Uh, the, the McGuffey Reading Clinic, which is located in the Curry School, is the, the longest consistently running reading clinic in the nation. Uh, and we've been involved in work within reading disabilities and dyslexia and disabilities uh, just more broadly for a, a significant amount of time. So any of you that, that are familiar with special education know, or hopefully you know about Public Law 94-142, which was the seminal law in the mid-70s that uh, founded the special education process and finally guaranteed individuals with disabilities a right for a public education. And ever since then, uh, individuals at University of Virginia and the Curry School and specifically have been engaged in applied in what we hope to be important research uh, in improving the lives of all individuals and particularly individuals with, with dyslexia. So we, we, we really focus on applied research, meaningful research, and then educating hopefully the, the future leaders in the field. So um, sometimes I think it's important to, to, to remember that, that we actually know a lot about dyslexia and teaching them how to read. We know, uh, we know how children le uh, learn to read. We know what instructional approaches are most effective. We know who's at risk for, for dyslexia. So in the area of education, there really isn't a, a, a focus, uh, a more in-depth area that we know the most about than in the area of reading. Dyslexia. Now, there's more to there's more to learn. There's no doubt about it. But from a thirty thousand foot view, we we've learned a lot, particularly in the in the research area. So so what don't we know if we don't know that? We we know what to do in a lot of cases, in most cases, but we don't know how to ensure all ch uh, children receive the evidence based reading instruction they need at the right time, at the right intensity. So this really isn't, in a large part at this point, a research problem. This is a willpower problem. This is an infrastructure problem. This is an advocacy problem. So uh, we have uh, the decoding dyslexia folks here. They talked about the reading handbook. These are the people that we need boots on the ground, fighting to make sure all individuals with dyslexia or just struggling uh, uh, learners of reading get the instruction that they need. So if you look, if, if you go back and you go into high school and you ask high school kids, uh, what was the most difficult thing that you had to learn in uh, school? reading 30, 40%. And these, and we're not just talking about uh, individuals with dyslexia, we're just talking overall. So um, it is an infrastructure, it's an implementation problem, so something that we really need to focus on. What else is missing? Um, 
One area that I think is missing that, we, that we've kind of neglected to take a look at is that we've really kind of focused on students' deficits throughout this process in the area of dyslexia and disabilities in general. And I pulled these, these quotes out. These are actual uh, lines from um, a, an individual education plan that I pulled across individuals with dyslexia's IEPs. And you'll notice a lot of deficit discussion, right? Students' weaknesses were noted in. This test indicated deficits in. The students demonstrated a lag of. Student was unable to. And so individuals with dyslexia and their families hear this over and over and over again. Deficit, 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 can't read, lag behind, unable to retrieve information. I think that's, that's uh, a missing area and something that we need to improve on. And also along with that, uh, although we've done a good job in general with them in the public schools and, and ensuring we're including individuals with disability, including with, with dyslexia, is we have a huge service and support cliff. We have a cliff when individuals transition from elementary school to middle school, middle school to high school, and then we have a, a gigantic cliff when they transition into college. Those supports and services are gone. Uh, and they're very hard to access. And even when you access them, they often are subpar and inappropriate and unable to really assist an individual to reach their achievement. So we've done a lot. We know a lot about reading. Uh, we, we can make a big difference in that area if we have the will to do so. And I think we need to develop the will to do so. And I'm so excited about decoding dyslexia and the work in Utah and other states that can help us do that because we need that kind of grassroots advocacy. But we still have work to do. We have to start looking about uh, not always focusing on deficits and, and address this cliff. So I, I ask you, if you can imagine if, instead of always focusing on deficits, we work to think about strengths and abilities. Everyone, no matter what, whether they have a disability or not, whether they're dys dyslexic or not, whether they have autism or not, have strengths and abilities that we should be able to harness in order to make a difference and, and uh, al allow them to achieve their potential. Imagine if also we fully supported students with dyslexia across a lifespan, ensuring they got those self-advocacy skills, ensuring, ensuring, ensuring that they're getting the support they need in their classroom, making sure that information is presented in different ways other than reading. Thinking about disability and dyslexia as a part of diversity. How can we make sure that we support individuals with dyslexia, particularly in post-secondary settings, but also in high school settings? as being really important areas and things that we want, need to focus on. So uh, that's our approach. That's our approach to disabilities in general at Curry School, and that's our approach to dyslexia specifically. Um, number one, we want to partner with uh, people with dyslexia and their families. So the research agenda and the training agenda changes when we talk to people and we work with people who um, are dealing with these issues day in and day out. What are the most important things? What can we advocate for? critical for us to take a look at. We also got to think about uh, cross-disciplinary research and, and training. So right now, if you were to go to pretty much any university and just stay in the College of Education, we train our reading professionals over here, we train our special education professionals over here, we train our, our elementary uh, professors over here, and then way over here is the secondary school. <laughs> so um, we, need, we need to start thinking about cross-disciplinary training from from pediatricians to clinical psychologists to school psychologists to special education teachers to reading specialists, uh, we really need to make sure that, that we're providing cohesive um, support, education, training uh, for all individuals with disabilities, including with dyslexia. We need to harness interest and skills. Uh, and that kind of seems, I think, sometimes when you think about it, well, yeah, of course. We need to think about what, this, what, what these students' strengths and skills are. We need to build on them. But we don't do a good job of that, I don't think, not, not in education. We've got to focus on those meaningful outcomes. What are meaningful outcomes for individuals? They're not always test scores, right? So we need to continue to work hard on, on reading and, uh, and improving overall reading ability. But what other outcome measures can we take a look at? Life outcomes. Uh, you know, if I were to ask you what the most, uh, the, the most thing you're most proud of, chances are you're not going to tell me because you're, you're a proficient reader. You know, I read at X level, right? You have meaningful life outcomes that are core and important to you. We need to start looking at those when we think about types of programs that we're going to provide. Focus on, uh, on the ability and then support across the lifespan. So that's our goal um, and focused on dyslexia at Curry School. Um, Three basic areas with that. So basic research, 
Uh, although I said, you know, 30,000 foot view, we know, we know a lot about dyslexia. We know a lot about the causes of dyslexia and things that are correlated uh, uh, with, uh, with dyslexia. So we can kind of guess who might uh, end up with a diagnosis of dyslexia. There's still a lot of research to do in that area related to genetics and brain in imaging. So we, we still, we're not giving up on uh, continuing and looking at link and, and seeing how we can improve uh, services we're providing to individuals with dyslexia. We need that cross-disciplinary research so we can learn from each other and really with a focus on those meaningful outcomes. So the, the great thing about being a college of education professor is we get to focus on applied research in the, in the schools and the community settings. And we need to bring that kind of strength to our more basic researchers. And then the cross-disciplinary uh, training that I talked about. Core principles for us, person, family at the center, focus on strengths, comprehensible, sustainable across a lifespan. Uh, and we repeat this constantly when we talk about disabilities and, and how we want to focus on those. And the best way for us to make sure we say uh, align with those is to make sure we're, we're as close to working with, with individuals with disabilities and they become a part of, of our community and our organization. If you're not, if you're, if you're working in the dyslexia area and you don't know anybody who has dyslexia, you're not working with them, you're not doing your job, obviously. You're not, you're not making a difference. So we got a lot of challenges. Uh, but we could also look at them as big opportunities. So what, what can we do in this area in, in order to make a difference? Um, I would probably say uh, that I'd like to point out that there are already people doing stuff in this area that are making a big difference, particularly related with, with transition and related to strength-based approach. And might I say would be the Joseph James Morelli Scholarship. Do we have some scholarship awardees that are here today? I think uh, you know it's 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 been amazing work. 68 scholarships so far, focusing on individuals that have a, an interest and a passion for doing STEM education, and and providing them with some funds and also the validation. I heard that several times when I was talking to folks out in the other room. The validation that that they're worth uh, the resources and the support in order to reach their potential. It's huge. It's huge. But with, within this, uh, in talking to Barb, uh, Barb had said, working with the families and also uh, with her experience with Joseph found that, you know, in these college environments, there was that cliff and there was that huge, huge struggle. So we, we haven't done a good job with that. We don't have a lot of re research to, and, and ideas to think about how we can support individuals with disabilities broadly and dyslexia specifically within a college environment. So we have, we have more work to do in that area. That's an area where we don't have that much research. That's an area where we don't have that much advocacy and we don't, and we don't train professionals in special education and psychology and um, uh, post-secondary education uh, to do a very good job. So, I would uh, submit to you that a potential next step for uh, moving along this idea of addressing the cliff, addressing a strength-based approach would be to think about supporting graduate education and PhD studies and postdoc studies related to um, examining these issues experimentally and then also becoming advocates uh, once they take positions in higher education related to providing supports for individuals with, with disabilities in that particular environment and developing um, empirical interventions and approaches that, that are going to be helpful for them. So I would say a wonderful next step might be the James, uh, Joseph James Morelli Bicentennial Fellowship at UVA. And our focus for this particular scholarship is to, to fully fund a doctoral student, so uh, provide everything they need in order to pursue their, their PhD full time and utilize that individual uh, uh, and provide cross-disciplinary training where they're going to be working from uh, neuropsychology to reading education to special education with a focus, uh, a laser focus on that transition from high school uh, to college and beyond and, and translating research into practice. Again, that's the wonderful thing about being in a college of education is that we get to focus really on that translation piece and, and making a meaningful difference for, for individuals. So our, our, our view for, for this scholarship is cross-disciplinary. Um, reading education, special education, but also with the, our folks in the Brain Institute, focusing on a strength-based, comprehensive approach. It is time for us to start thinking about how we can harness individual strengths, how we can provide support, how we can think about disability as a part of diversity, and how we value diversity, and what these people have to offer to us, not just what we have to offer to them. So that's, that's our uh, 
transformative solution idea is, is how we can bring all these individuals together. And we see uh, the Morelli Fellowship and the sponsorship of, of, of doctoral students for, for forever, quite honestly, because it would be a fund that would continue as, as a wonderful step in the right direction. So thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate it. Our second presenter is Donnell Pons. Donnell is a reading and dyslexia specialist in Salt Lake City. Pons started her career in education when her youngest son was diagnosed with dyslexia. She went on to receive a dual master's degree in education and teaching from Westminster College, along with a certification in special education. She's also a tutor in several Orton Gillingham based reading programs and is a certi certified dyslexia screener and consultant. Pons currently sits on the board of Decoding Dyslexia Utah, works at the University of Utah Reading Clinic, and is a former literacy director at American International School of Utah. That's a lot. Her mission is to identify, screen, and remediate every student who struggles with reading and engage every K through 12 teacher in the reading process. Welcome, Donnell. Come on up. Thank you. Of course, I'm not doing all of those things right now, but <laughs> I have done, and I'm no longer at the University of Utah Reading Clinic, but thank you for mentioning them because they do a lot of good work too. And this tonight is really about collaboration. Um, I look out on the audience and most of the people I've met tonight in some way are, are trying to help people uh, who are either struggling with reading or coming to know the world of those who struggle with reading, so I appreciate you being here and all that you do as well. I started a book years ago. I think that's what happens when you struggle with something. You, you try to get it out, you put it down to try to deal with what it is you're going through. And so when we started this journey, when my son, we, we discovered that he had dyslexia, we'd had a daughter who had struggled, and then of course, my dear husband, when we got married, um, I discovered that he had dyslexia, and he did not know, and he'd been struggling with reading. So it's been a part of our lives, it's our lifelong journey. And I had found a way to kind of deal with it by writing. And so Barbara's asked me, I, this is a book I'd like to have published, but it's the preface to the book, and I shared it with Barbara, and Barbara said, oh, you've got to read that. So that's why I'm reading it. Uh, but I'm first going to show you a picture. So I'm going to get to our first slide here. The name of the book is titled after something my son would always say when he wanted to talk to you. And he would say, I'm going to tell you something you don't know that is mostly true. And he would do that with everybody. <laughs> so I thought that's a great way to start this. And this is just my perspective. And then you've got to see this face. Yeah, okay, so... Just picture the face and I'll tell you the rest. Um, first, I must explain the title of the work, which when all is said and done, will be largely about my youngest son, Bridger. So it only seems fitting that I chose a title that would embody the personality, flair, and wit of this complex boy. When Bridger learned to talk, which seems like the day he was born, he started everything he said with the phrase, I'm going to tell you something that you don't know that is mostly true. No matter what followed, he always seemed to have a captive audience. I guess I decided to try for the same magic, even though I don't think it will be nearly as effective because I'm not two years old with big brown eyes and a contagious smile. In fact, those big brown eyes and contagious smile are the real reason I thought I could write a book about dyslexia. Actually, I think being the mother of a child with dyslexia makes you think about a lot of things, like why learning to read is so critical to academic success and why not learning to read is so prevalent, yet still shrouded in secrecy and a certain sense of personal failure. This book also came about because I'm tired of being misunderstood as the mother of a child with dyslexia or a learning disability or slow processing, because apparently it's all the same thing and is used simultaneously to explain why my boy struggles to read. I myself have many labels like frustrating, disappointing, heartbreaking, for what has become the reality of learning in the public school system for a boy who makes sense of things differently or just at a rate and speed that's all his own. And still, after all these years of talking, reading, studying, and learning about dyslexia, I'm not convinced I'm any closer to truly understanding the beautiful complexity of how my son learns and what that difference means or the many ways in which his difference can enrich my life and the lives of those around him. One thing I do know is that having a child with a learning disability has forced me to reassess my own learning process. At first, you do this to find clues, things you might have missed that will suddenly reveal to you why your child struggles. In the case of dyslexia, this may include questioning other family members to find out if they, too, struggled with reading, because you'll learn that this often runs in families. You may even discover that your spouse had a similar tricky history with reading that he or she has kept buried because of its obvious painful associations. Or you may discover, as I did, 
that your father, who has since passed away, had a painful secret that he kept hidden from his spouse and children that turned out to be dyslexia. As you become more open with your child's struggles, you'll find people throughout your neighborhood, workplace, and social circles who either grapple directly with reading challenges or have children who are wrestling with it at school. In fact, once I started opening up about my son's challenges, I began being approached by parents on a regular basis who were desperate to find help for one or more of their children who was quietly and painfully fighting to learn how to read with fluency and ease in order to be just like everyone else. So I'm a reluctant expert. I've become well-versed in the language of learning disabilities out of necessity. I volunteered in countless classrooms across my city, gone back to school and received dual master's degrees in education and learning with certification in special education, read hundreds of books on the education system and learning challenges, and yet I still feel at a loss when my son starts a new school year with a different teacher who doesn't understand what it takes to engage this boy. And if our public education system has any hope of improving outcomes for children with learning differences across the socioeconomic spectrum, then showing up at the first day of the year at a public school in any neighborhood shouldn't be fraught with anxiety in hopes of getting a teacher who knows how to work with all kinds of minds. So that's the preface to the story, to the book. I want to show you this one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is my son graduating from the University of Utah Reading Clinic. And this is my son making snowshoes. No one else would make them. He stayed at school till 8 o'clock at night, finishing everybody's snowshoes. These are the things that we don't pay attention to. And then two dyslexics that I love, my husband and my son. <laughs> um, one thing that you do realize is we've known about dyslexia for a long time. And doing some research, we often hear of William Pringle Morgan associated with dyslexia, but it was actually in Germany with an ophthalmologist. So lots of folks in different fields realized something was going on. And he actually gave it the term dyslexia. And even though he named the ship, he never became her captain. And the person who did is actually William Pringle Morgan in England. And he was a general practitioner. And he referred to it as word blindness. And what was interesting is they figured that Pringle Morgan was associated with dyslexia more because he gave it a human face. And he actually put the first person to it. And it was Percy F., a well-grown lad, age 14. And he's always been a bright and intelligent boy. And that is the individual who gets associated with dyslexia. The reading instruction, we've known for a long time how to help kids with dyslexia. Unfortunately, it make, doesn't make its hands into, into the hands of teachers. I was one of them who didn't know. And Samuel T. Orton, a neuropathologist, again, many people working out of different fields, in 1925, he presents this paper. And of, they said of Orton, of all the early pioneers, he was the one who, more than anyone else, put what we now call developmental dyslexia on the map. The year again, 1925. We've known for a really long time. Orton was one of the first to advocate for phonics instruction for those with dyslexia. And he teamed up with Dr. Anna Ann Gillingham. And together, we have that thing called the Orton-Gillingham method, or a way of teaching. And then today, the International Dyslexia Association recommends structured literacy, which is a, a lot of things. I know I'm going through this quickly, but I've got 15 minutes. I'm going to move on. Um, defining dyslexia, this is one of the more interesting parts. The definition of dyslexia, oftentimes as, as an educator, you know who the kids are. I did in my classroom. And the definition, we often move away from it, but it's very helpful in helping us to see who those, who those students are in our classrooms, who they are in our families. Uh, the International Dyslexia Association says that it's a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. So it's in the brain and it's characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition by poor spelling and decoding abilities. It gives us a little more of the definition, but I like Dr. Sally Shaywitz from the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, and she's written a fine book, Overcoming Dyslexia, and done a lot of research. But she has a quick one, a concise one. Dyslexic children and adults struggle to read fluently, spell words correctly, and learn a second language, among other challenges. But these difficulties have no connection to their overall intelligence. And that's the piece I like. In fact, dyslexia is an unexpected difficulty in reading in an individual who has the intelligence to be a much better reader. And I put that in bold because that's, that's it right there. And while people with dyslexia are slow readers, they often paradoxically are very fast and creative thinkers with strong reasoning abilities. And I like her definition because, again, it's the human side of dyslexia. And that's what we're talking about. And then these are just some statistics, if you aren't aware, and many of you are, that one in five children in the US have learning and attention issues. That's a lot of children. So as an educator in my classrooms, that number definitely, and in some classrooms it can be higher. 
and only a small subset receive specialized instruction or accommodations. So only one in 16 in the public school setting are going to receive help, and then one in 50 that should be receiving accommodations or help are really gonna receive it, one out of 50. That's not a lot of people who are receiving help. And our common examples of what they're talking about with learning disabilities is dyslexia, um, dyscalculia or dyscalculia, and dysgraphia. And then this other slide is another one to help us understand how widespread is dyslexia of the school population that actually receives services in special education of that pie, there's about, you know, it has the number up there of the kids who are receiving those services. And that's about 13 to 14%. Then you draw, drill that down, and of those students in special education, you have LD, and of those who have LD, that large slice is reading. That's about 85% of those students who have a primary learning disability, it's in reading and language processing. So it's huge, and yet as a special educator, I never heard the word dyslexia in my training, not once. It was never mentioned, and I had a really good program. And then when I got to service children, I didn't have what I needed, and I didn't know what I was looking for. And then the bottom here, the population as a whole, up to 15 to 20% of the population as a whole may have symptoms of dyslexia. Well, that's a lot of people that have not received services. And in the state of Utah, we don't diagnose dyslexia in the school system. So many of our students exit school not really knowing why they struggled with reading, if they received help at all. This other statistic here, I think, cannot be overlooked. This is from the NAEP, National Assessment for Educational Progress. This number is 2015. I didn't bother bringing 2017 because the number is pretty much the same and it has been static for decades. We have 37% of our students who they figure are prepared in reading to go to college. 37%. That leaves the majority not reading at a level where we feel they're prepared for college. And this is the NAEP. I want to show you another statistic that goes with it. This blue line above shows you college enrollment rate. That's that high number there ending out at 66%. The college preparedness rate in reading that I just showed you the slide before at 38%. We have a massive gap between those who want to go to college, enroll in college, who actually have the skills in reading to be successful at college. And that's largely what we're talking about tonight is helping our college students and those who've made it through the system who still need our help to be successful, who have all the potential in the world, but they need the help to do it. And then this last one, the profile of struggling reader and appropriate instruction. It's just a quick slide, and really I'm interested in tier one. We have great interventions at all tiers, but really the general classroom where we could be doing a lot of this work and we're not is relatively easy. There's a gentleman named Dr. Kilpatrick, and he's actually been to the state of Utah to talk to educators. And he actually has a very simple, he calls it the simple view of reading. And he's taken the last 30 years of reading research, condensed it down into a book that was just published in 2015, and makes it a very approachable uh, system for educators to get information. And he just gives you three quick things to look for in a struggling reader, very solid things to look for. And then appropriate instruction includes three things to look for for educators. Oftentimes, this has never been shown to educators. They didn't even know that you could distill some of this information that easily for them. And then just to move on to dyslexia legislation, we have 42 states that have dyslexia-specific laws. We have 33 dyslexia-related bills that were introduced just between January and March 2018. Thankfully, we're moving ahead and people are getting the word out. And decoding dyslexias across the country have been a big part of that and we applaud them for their work. And one of the things our local decoding dyslexia just did for us, which is terrific, and a lot of people don't even know it yet, is just a few weeks ago, we got, we became the 17th state to get a handbook on dyslexia, which is tremendous, yeah, so, huge, yeah. This is big for us, huge for the state of Utah. And we were there for the vote, we've got another member of decoding dyslexia here, who was a part of the process, and it was a unanimous vote for that handbook. This is the thing, is when you start talking and sharing and collaborating, our, our Department of Education here in the state of Utah, they want our kids to be successful. And so this is hopefully one way that we can move forward is partnering with each other and helping each other to be able to move this, this a little forward for our students. And it's, that's what it's going to take to help our, our students to get the services they need. And there's our handbook. I just wanted to show you that's the cover. It may change, they're doing some adjustments. And we'll have a link, and when it's live, we'll put it up um, to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to see it. But this is the phrase that I, I think is just something very empowering for parents or anyone who's dealt with dyslexia. It is the responsibility of local education agencies to implement effective universal screening processes and use the information they collect to make important determinations about dyslexia-specific accommodations and interventions for at-risk students. 
awesome. So now when you have parents who say, my kid's struggling, what do we do? And you go to the school and they say, gosh, we don't have anything. We haven't been trained. We can go to the manual now. We can open it to the handbook and say, well, let's walk through this together. It's to be used by educators as well as the schools and parents to sit down together. That's, that's really big for us in our state, is really putting a face to and helping to have resources for individuals who are struggling with reading. I wanted to just quickly say, I began this journey. This wasn't the first place I started. I was actually a reporter for the Salt Lake Tribune. I'd been a writer for years, and I thoroughly enjoyed reading and writing. And so that had not been my struggle. But then I got married to a great guy, and we'd only been married a couple of days, and we're on our honeymoon. And we're camping at the base of the Tetons, and I always buy a book when I'm out camping because I think it's fun to read in the tent at night. Climbed into the tent, pulled out the book, started to read, and I thought I'd just pass it over to him and he'd take over the reading duties. And what came out of his mouth was a total struggle to make sense of the page. And he was fighting and wrestling with it and doing his best. And there was a pattern to what he was doing, and I could tell he'd been doing this a long time. And what do you do when the man you love, who didn't tell you, is struggling like that? I don't want anyone to ever have a moment like that. And so I turned to him and gently started a conversation to which he said, I read pretty well for my family. He had a family of dyslexics at home who did not know they had dyslexia. And then to find out that he was on the dean's list at the University of Utah, graduated from high school, was in college, and no one, no one, stop to say why is he struggling like that with reading and he doesn't need to. So that's what we're all working so hard for. Tonight, this event, many others, is to make sure that that doesn't happen, to give everybody an opportunity. So thank you for being here. Our third guest is Jared Madsen. He's the owner of Madsen Cycles a successful cargo bike manufacturing company. He's a husband and business partner to Lisa, father of three. Jared was diagnosed with dyslexia and ADHD as a young child. It made traditional school and learning to read a tremendous struggle. Yet, he says dyslexia can actually be a huge gift in that it helped him think and act outside the box his entire life. He believes his unique creativity entrepreneurial passion, clever hands, and mechanical mind largely evolved as a result of his dyslexia. His drawings are remarkable, and we have um, a bunch of them outside in the hallway, so when you leave, stop and check those out. You're going to meet Jared in person in just a minute, but right now, you're going to see him up here on the big screen. I remember in grade school, my fourth grade class, I remember like sitting in the, in, I, I spent lots of time looking out the window, you know. And I remember looking out the window and seeing people walking on the street, and I remember just thinking, oh man, how awesome would it be to not have to go to school, you know. Uh, and I remember thinking, oh man, that'd be so awesome just to forget school, you know, why, why can't we just bail on the school? The very beginning of school, like kindergarten, I don't really think anyone knew that I was going to have a hard time in school. I loved to draw, and I was really good at drawing. I was really good at making things and building things and putting things together. I loved taking things apart and playing with them. But I guess first grade is when things start to happen, and other kids were reading, and it was really cool. They're reading these books that were fun and exciting and wanting to read, too. I wanted to read, and I couldn't. I just couldn't. I couldn't get my alphabet. A friend of my mom's was a child psychologist, and so I remember meeting with him for a few times, and he was the first one to diagnose me with being dyslexic. And that's all it was. It was just I couldn't get the numbers and letters to, to work. So first grade, they had a resource, which was for kids that were delayed in, for whatever reason. And the teacher would come to the door and every day for resource and call out all the names that needed to go to resource, and I just remember how just devastated as a boy, just like, oh, everyone is just laughing at me and just the shame of walking out of class. I remember seventh grade, walking home, someone I was walking with was like, hey, you got your report card? I'm like, yeah. He's like, what did you, what did you get? 
And they're like, well, I don't know, there's lots of different grades. And I didn't want to tell him what I got. He goes, well, what's your GPA? I'm like, oh, I'd probably say for telling him that. I'm like, well, what's the GPA? He's like, oh, that's the number at the bottom. And then I told him, I remember it was a 1.4. And he was like, what? A 1.4? Like, can you even get a 1.4? You know, and I, I didn't know what any of that even meant. But I, I could tell from his reaction, like, well, this is not something I should share with anybody else. And I put this report card away. And uh, yeah, that was my first report card. At that time of life, all the kids I was in resource with, so all the kids from grade school and then also in junior high, that was when they stopped coming to school. So they either dropped out or maybe they moved or, but no one went with me to high school. They were, they were gone. I think back and I, I'm just lucky that somehow I didn't believe my report card. My mom would tell me, oh, you're so smart. You're so good at this. Look how good you are at shop. And, art and you're just amazing and she'd always tell me that I'm a leader you know you're such a leader all the kids want to be like you and somehow I listened to her even though I remember saying to her once well if I'm a leader why is nobody following me you know like oh it's just that hasn't happened yet I remember my senior year realizing I'm not going to be able to graduate so my counselor calls me in right there's like Oh man, there's like two weeks left of, class, of school. And he calls me and he says, Jared, you're not going to graduate. You're missing all these credits. And, and I had set myself up for this because I knew it too, but he told me that I was going to be okay. So I remember reminding him of that conversation. And I'm like, I was in here, you know, at the beginning of the year when I actually had time to do something about it. And, and now you're telling me that I'm not going to graduate. You're my counselor, you're supposed to be taking care of me. I thought there was a problem and you, you know, I put this all on him, I'm just this punk kid, you know, setting him all up and he's like, oh, well, let me, let me review that again and see what we can do. And I'm like, okay. So the next day he calls me back and goes, oh, don't worry, it's totally okay. You're gonna graduate. I, I, I made a mistake and I'm like, well, what is it? And he pulls out this list of all those classes I signed up for at the community college. I never took them, I never went to them, but get all these classes and he goes, oh, I didn't realize you have all these credits from the community college. When you're that, he knew I did it and he knew that I knew and, and I knew that he knew and I'm like, oh, great, that's, that's great. <laughs> Put that all in my permanent record and the next week I was able to graduate from my class and put high school behind me. And my friends that dropped out of high school, I, I wonder where they are and I say my friends, but just the kids that I was with, in the resource program, these, I, I just, I look at it and go, they definitely were failed. More than anything, I think that just, we destroy the self-esteem of these little minds. We shattered these kids. I was shattered in grade school and I had a whole other section of people like cheering for me and, and putting me back together every day afterwards. But there's so many kids that don't have that, you know, that, uh, and we just failed them. And I still feel it. I don't like walking into the school. I get that same feeling. My wife wants me to go talk to the te their teacher or something. I'm just like, oh, no, no way. It wasn't until I finally entered real life. He realized, man, real life is not about this small box. Real life is about outside the box. If I could pass that message on to someone like me, that real life is awesome. I'm running this business now. We sell bikes all over the world. We're one of the top cargo bike companies in the country and it definitely has nothing to do with being in this little box. It has everything to do with being outside of it. Life gets better. First off, Jared, why don't you tell everybody what that video originally was supposed to be? Uh, well, originally this was a video uh, uh, that was gonna be produced for, for our company, for Madison Cycles, and after about five hours of interviewing from the, the producer that I, I got a call the next day saying he was hoping that he could change the format of the video. There was another story in there that he thought would be a lot more interesting to, uh, to tell and it was about the, my learning disabilities and my struggles in high school and well in grade school and through all of school. And uh, to, be, to be honest, this was only uh, four or five years ago. I had 
never told, well, of course I've told some people, but it would be something I would never want anyone to know about. The shame that's behind, uh, for, for me, for someone with dyslexia, the shame that has been programmed in me since I was such a young boy, I didn't want to share with anyone. I would never, something I just want to hide so much. But I was on the phone with him, and I, I'm a grown up now, and I'm cool and, and confident. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, do it. Whatever, whatever you think is going to be best. He, he wanted to submit it to uh, Outside Magazine for a contest. And I remember hanging up just thinking, what have I said? He's got <laughs> hours and hours of footage of me talking about all kinds of personal things. He can write any story he wants. And then, then he came back the next day and did another four hours of, of uh, it's only a five minute video, but <laughs> so, he walks away. I'm like, he can portray me any way he wants. And, and I'll be honest, if it wasn't for the success that I already had in life, if it wasn't for the company that you've already built, I would never have allowed that to happen. And, and even then, even now, I know this is a really safe audience, but it's something I still keep so private and hidden. And I don't, the shame that's, we have all these amazing abilities to teach people with divergent learning abilities or the dyslexic mind. And we know all these facts and figures, but if we can't cross that gap that you're talking about and actually get it to the, the children that need it, we there's few kids, I would say almost none, that are going to get any of these things handed to them if it's not for the parent or a, a guardian that's, that's pushing for them, that's actually showing them these things. And I sat in that resource program with all these kids that didn't have any of that. Uh, I sat again in, in a reading program in junior high with a whole bunch of kids that didn't have that. And uh, again, in, in high school, it just and they, they all dropped out. I was the only one that I knew of in that group that was able to graduate. And I probably shouldn't have either, but it wasn't for my mom <laughs> pushing behind it, it all. sounds like you bullied the school yeah. counselor, frankly. Yeah. 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 So Bill, you talk about it fully supporting across the lifespan. Mm. What does that look like? Um, I mean, so I think it's strength-based, and then it's making sure that we put the supports in there so that individuals can access and be successful in a different modality other than reading, I think is the primary one when it comes to dyslexia. And you know, one thing I would um, uh, point out about Jared's case is um, look at what he's done. I mean, as a society, it benefits us to enable people to access their strengths. I mean, this is not, this is, this is not um, charity work. This is harnessing um, people in our society who have wonderful gifts that, that can mean a lot to us, to Salt Lake City, to the country, to you sell bikes across the world. Um, so uh, it's, it's really an important thing that we work on, I think. What careers are better suited to dyslexics? Um, you know, so I, I think we think about some of these more mechanical ones, but uh, as, as potentials, and, um, but really it's, it, it is pretty individualized. Uh, related to uh, dyslexia, so it's really helping that individual find find their passion, and, and and you know it might not even be that they have a strength in something, but they have an interest, they have an inkling of interest in elementary school or middle school, and and you let them harness that interest and then yoke their educational experience through that. So all of us, I can guarantee you, and I say these to my undergraduates, if you came into a classroom here. Uh, and I started to ask you to do, do things that you weren't able to do, I would see the most outrageous behavioral problems about a bunch of college kids that you could ever imagine. So when you think about a dyslexic individual who goes to school day after day after day, and the primary task that they're asked to do, reading, is the most difficult thing for them in the world. It's amazing uh, what they accomplish without these supports. So think about what they could accomplish with a more comprehensive approach. I'm scanning the audience to see if there are any Utah lawmakers here. I don't see any. So let's put Donnell on the spot if there was a Utah lawmaker here. <laughs> what kind of legislation would you encourage that lawmaker to sponsor in January? Yeah. Okay. Ooh, I like that question. Uh, we do know what we should be doing. And as Bill mentioned too, and we've had a lot of conversations about this over the last couple of days. We shouldn't be having teachers leaving education teaching programs not knowing more about reading. I mean, that's essentially, yeah. yeah. 
and to change that, it takes all of us. It, it does, and we can. The thing is, we know that, know that we can, and we have the great research, years of it. We know what it means not to do this, so by all means, let's do what we should do and change the outcomes, and that would be making sure that when teachers hit the schools, they have the tools that they need, not teachers hit the school and have nothing that they need, and then we hope they get what they need. That isn't a great system, and it hasn't been working for the last 30 years. When do we say learning disability versus learning difference? Language is important, right? The words we use. Yeah, um, yeah. I think we're starting to see a focus, uh, a little broader focus. And when we think about differences, then we're th we can we can invite the conversation related to strengths instead of just focusing on the disability. And you put up the slide about the deficit language. Mm. Can't, don't. What what should we be saying instead? Help all of us here understand when we speak about this, how we can speak of it in the affirmative as opposed to the negative. I mean, I think, I mean, one thing uh, that I certainly would still recognize is individuals with dyslexia have difficulty learning how to read. And our, we're in a society where reading is important and we need to try to teach reading. And we have some evidence-based approaches to do that. But we need to think about the child and the individual holistically. Uh, so what are their strengths? What are their interests? Where do they see their career path? How, how can we get them exposed? Jared was talking about before, before we got on stage of uh, going into middle school and having metal shop and, and wood shop and being exposed to experiences so they could find something that interests them. Uh, and his story, um, although extraordinary, is not unique in that way. Finding a, uh, something that they can latch onto, so whether it's with the Morelli uh, scholarship and STEM education or, or something else, and then, and then getting that motivation and then providing them with the skills and support to make, make a difference. And I think I'm going to jump in just, yeah. I think I shared earlier, but it illustrated to me, and I thought I had done a fairly good job of watching the language that I use, seeing people as diverse, but it was really interesting, and it was my husband, who I thought I knew most of your story about dyslexia, we've shared it plenty, but you were being interviewed, and I think something happens when you're being interviewed, <laughs> you share a lot. And you mentioned that you had vivid memories, and this just really struck me, you had vivid memories of preschool, and you were a rock star in preschool. You could build anything, you, could, you had kids following you around to see what you were gonna do next, you were the most extraordinary in preschool. And then you hit kindergarten, and they introduced the letters, and you start slipping, and you felt yourself slipping. And the kids were now, what's, well, he's over in the corner, and he's at the small table. And then first grade, you're out in the hallway. And then second grade, you're nowhere near the classroom. And you said, it was over for me by second grade. I was never going to be on top again. That's, we can't do that. We should never do that. Does anyone have a question in the audience? And if folks have questions, if y'all just want to line up down the aisle, feel free. Hi there. Um, my question is, I work with students privately who are dyslexic. How do you help them not feel ashamed? I have an 18-year-old student who I wanted to come tonight with me. And she said, oh, no, I don't want anyone to know I'm dyslexic. And I said, well, they wouldn't have to know you're dyslexic. There's people here who are family members. That, but it, it just breaks my heart. So anything you can do to help me help my students. Thank you. Oh, Jared, I mean, you tell a great story. If we could bottle it, right, wouldn't you just put it in a bottle and sell it? How to help somebody get over that? I'm still trying to get over it. <laughs> so <laughs> it is. And that, that question, that is huge. I, I remember I spoke at a decoding dyslexia something. I had a few resource teachers come up and ask me that same kind of thing. And, and there is not a good answer. There's, this is, if I, if there was one thing that I could change somehow, if I could fix, it would be the shame that's attached to the, to the disability. Uh, I would say, so much of it is what you have said, is one of my biggest frustrations in high school and junior high is I would sit in art class and I was such, so much better than these other students, but they got an A because they tried and because they turned their assignments in. And then I would sit next to that same person in English and I was trying 10 times harder and I was getting a D and they were getting an A. I just wish there was some a better focus somehow on that we could actually, I mean, I talked about these super people that are strong in both areas, but we'll never know that in our current school system because everyone that's strong in reading can get an A in all classes, hmm. even if they're terrible at art or woodshop or 
music or, or history, whatever it is, but we just, the grading system is completely, it's not on an equal basis where if someone with dyslexia, if I could have really shined and my grade point average could have been the same because I'm great in these areas, not only am I great in them, but it's shown on my report card, maybe it would be easier for someone to show up in it. So teachers are the unsung heroes, right? You've got lots of students, you don't have a lot of time, heavens knows you're not paid enough. So it's frustrating, I'm sure, from an educator standpoint. What are we doing to educate our educators, Bill? You know, you've been in the teaching world for a long time. How do we help our teachers understand that shame's a powerful thing? Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of educators do know, and but they are taxed yeah. as far as the amount of time that they have to work with individuals and 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 what they're accountable for as far as outcomes, and they tend to to involve reading throughout throughout the day. Um, and I do think if it was a more if it was a broader curriculum, um, we would give opportunities for for people to shine uh, where they have those those particular strengths. But there's certainly education that we need to do, and uh, and I really do think it comes from the grassroots efforts from like decoding dyslexia in order to get those out and then work with your your um, advocates at the university and, and individuals that feel the same way in order to make a difference. Thank you. Well, good luck to your student. We hope she succeeds. Would you like to introduce yourself since our audience kind of knows you already? Yeah, I, I've been embarrassed plenty here. I'm Curtis Pons, Tunnel's <laughs> dyslexic husband. <laughs> um, my question is is mainly to Bill, I think. Uh, we've talked a little bit here tonight about th the problem of schools of education continuing to turn out teachers who are untrained in how to teach reading. And I'm super impressed by what you've said as a school of education that you are doing something about it. But I think you are a very tiny minority in the, all the schools of education throughout the country, throughout the world. How do, do we have any ideas how to get that to the next level so that your focus on turning out teachers that really know the real way to teach reading spread across the country? How is that done? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a really difficult challenge because it is true, uh, and a vast majority, I would say, I could say majority of, of colleges of education, they're not teaching the science of reading or uh, teaching. We're, we are different in that way. We've had the McGuffey Reading Clinic for a long period of time, and the, and the program in special education, we, we, we do that. But even us, you know, uh, not, to, not to pat my, ourselves on the back uh, not, uh, too much, the reality is, is we as as educators don't have the time necessarily to give teachers that that background that they need, at least in their pre-service education. So we need to continue to work with them for professional development when they're when they're in the schools. Uh, and again, I think it's um, there's an organization called uh, uh, Deans for for Change, and they're a, they're a college of education organization that's saying that wants to make that difference. And Dean Pianta, who's the dean at the Curry School, is a, a founder member of that organization and pushing towards outcomes. So um, instead of just having students progress through taking courses, making them demonstrate that they're able to teach reading and these other skills. Um, but it's a difficult problem because the reality is, is there's a need for all teachers. So we are, um, we are a drop in the bucket. Uh, and it is the same thing similar to the will in order to make sure every child uh, gets appropriate and intensive reading instruction is, is the will to go ahead and, and uh, hold College of Education accountable and, and on the same time provide them with the resources in, in order to do that. We have time for one last quick question. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Mitch. I have a lot of theories, right, that I, I want to pursue in my PhD and, and they're all sort of based in, in the connection between creativity and dyslexia. Mm. Um, I guess my question that all of you, I'd love to hear your take, is, is what do we know about the connection between creativity and dyslexia? And, and I, what is the Curry School, what's, what's sort of the status there on what's being done um, to connect those things? And, and what advice might you have for me embarking on this PhD? Um, where might I begin? Yeah. Oh, great, great question. 
Um, you know, so so creativity is an, an, an interesting animal, and that you think about. In order, it, typically, creativity requires a, a, a um, strong interest and background knowledge in a particular topic, right? So that falls right into that strength-based ability. And then, uh, you know, often in in education, we think of part of that being structured, and then, boy, if you can harness that motivation and then and then let loose as far as the creativity you can you can you can unleash something miraculous uh, i think when it comes to uh, and donnell can correct me if i'm wrong when it comes to creativity and and dyslexia as far as a research base most of it is anecdotal with with individuals uh, and we see lots of examples of it um, and and what could be proof points of of that kind of connection between creativity and having dyslexia but it's a ripe area for research to do kind of some of that basic work to see where they are and, and how they might connect. Thank Jared, you. I think you're a living example uh, of no. creativity, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's another thing. We need to funnel people who have a lot of creativity and ideas into these fields where they come in contact with individuals who maybe struggle in another area but could have a strength in another area. I don't think we do enough of that, like you were saying about sharing information, about collaborating and bringing groups together. And so I think that's very important because that's a way in which we could tap into maybe other areas or avenues we haven't thought of. And an individual who came to speak last week in the state of Utah, Dean Braganier, who has a, a curriculum that he introduces, and he's dyslexic, and he has a, an entrepreneur curriculum that he introduces into middle school students and, and some high school students as well. But his whole idea is we pull kids out to remediate reading, which needs to happen, but that's all we do. How about we pull them out also to do something that they're really good at or they could really flourish at? And so that's his idea is two days a week I'm remediating and reading, but two days a week I also get to go out for an entrepreneur program. And he's playing with that program back east and having a lot of success. Dean also acknowledges not every kid who has dysle dyslexia is going to be a great entrepreneur. So now if you just introduce this kid to another area where I'm not very good at that either. And so what he's done is rounded out the program with a lot of different areas, which I think is smart. And so if you're not really great at this thing where Dean was awesome, let's try this one and maybe and see. So he says there's a wide variety of things that you can do. And then it's also on team building. And he'd like to see people without dyslexia and people with dyslexia on the same team, which would be interesting. Anyway, just good ideas, but we have a lot we could do with this area. Thank you.